You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. This episode of the Sketchnote Army Podcast is brought to you by the Sketchnote Idea Book, the sketchbook designed for sketchnoters. Equipped with a no bleed, no show through paper, the Sketchnote Idea Book can take almost any marker or pen you can throw at it. Learn more at sketchnoteideabook.com. And now, on with the show. In this episode, my good buddy and fellow sketchnoter, Professor Michael Clayton, interviews me about the eighth birthday of the Sketchnote Handbook. We'll talk about the eight years since the book launched, translations into seven languages, the community it enabled, the teaching opportunities it opened up, and the in-person and online events it inspired. I think you'll enjoy this one. Hey everyone, it's Mike Rohde here, and I'm with my friend, Professor Michael Clayton, for a special edition of the Sketch Down Army podcast. Happened to realize that um, today, November 30th, 2020, is the eight-year anniversary of the Sketchnote Handbook. So I thought it'd be fun to get Mike on and just chat a little bit about the eight years of history and what happened back in the old days and talk about some of the things that the handbook has spawned and created in those years. So, Michael, welcome. Hi, thanks, Mike. It's nice to be back. So I guess I'm taking the driver's seat in this interview uh, and flipping the script here a little bit. I think you are, and, yes. Uh, <laughs> So I, I don't I don't know how many of the listeners actually know this, but uh, we actually met for the first time back in 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, I was at a conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and just to give folks a little bit of, of background, um, I'm a, an educator here in South Texas, a graphic design professor, and I was at a conference for academics in Milwaukee, and I had been following this guy named Mike Rohde on Twitter for a long time, just really enamored with the sketch notes and the things that he did so knowing I was going to be in Milwaukee I just uh, shot a DM and said hey Mr. Rohde uh, I'm going to be in Milwaukee at this conference at this hotel uh, can we meet up for lunch and you just wrote back and said that's just like right around the corner from from where I work so yeah let's meet up for lunch and so it was a, it was a, a semi rainy day in October of 2012 and I remember uh, you had me. Where did we meet for lunch? It was uh, we went to the uh, Milwaukee Public Market, which is uh, sort of like a mini version of the Seattle uh, Fish Market, I guess something, something like that, along those lines. And I remember I, I walked up and and we met and we walked over and sat down and you just let out a big sigh of relief. And I asked you how your day had been and you told me I just turned in the manuscript for my first book. Wow. And it was it was that morning. I don't know if you remember that, but it was that morning that you had turned it in and then you had come and had lunch with me. I had I've forgotten that. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> and I just sat there going, <gasps> and then you, you we proceeded to talk about it and the kind of work that you did on it and the mm. different people that you're able to contact to because, you know, one of our mutual friends is is uh, featured in in the first book and we'll talk about that in in a little bit. So you know, Mike, because we've been sitting here just chatting for a little bit before the podcast started, a lot of the listeners already know the story about visual note taking and sketch noting, mm-hmm. and and where this came from, and your your need to do something more than just take a pencil and a paper, but to move, you know, as you say in in the first pages of your book, to move to a smaller format and to use pen instead and and stuff like that. So just kind of you know, reintroduce us to, to the idea of, of where this all came from. Hmm. Well, it was, um, it came from pain. That's how I start a lot of my presentations. Uh, I was in a painful place where I was really good at note taking and I hated it. <laughs> that's a, uh, that's a bad combo when you're good yep. at something that you hate <clears throat> because you can often feel trapped in it. So yeah, I, I was very good at taking notes. I was, uh, would listen. The problem was I tried to write everything down use pencil in case I made mistakes, had giant books because, well, I had to in order to capture everything and would just write frantically in meetings and conferences. And then it was just such a volume of information. I never, never really wanted to go back into that jungle and hack my way through to find the the nuggets that were, I'm sure, in there. And it just finally reached ahead right at the end of 2006 and early 2007 when I just said, I can't I can't do this any this any more this way. I need to change. 
that's when the new constraints came in the small book the pen testing it out you know i'm, I'm re- really big at in uh prototyping and testing ideas so it felt like a good thing uh to test out and experiment with at a conference in chicago which is about a hour and a half train ride from here in milwaukee took those tools you know the small book the moleskin and the i think it was a pilot g2 gel pen i went to this conference and just started playing and for me you know coming from that place remember i was frantically trying to keep up and write everything down when you don't write everything down it suddenly feels like i was on a on a desert island on a vacation like i don't have to write anything down what's i didn't know what to do with myself so i started uh kind of doodling and sketching and drawing the ideas that i was thinking in my head and if something interesting came on the screen from the presentations i would capture that and draw it in my own interpretation and I was still writing, but I was writing quite a bit less and doing a lot more analysis and making decisions in my head. So a lot of it moved off of the paper back into my head where I would decide what stuff was going to appear on the page. In a lot of ways, I became much more of an editor, right? You become sort of this live editor of information, which I wasn't doing before. I was just barfing it on the page and not really giving two thoughts about what was going on there. It was just simply going in my ear and out my hand and never stopping in between. So it was uh, quite a, even that first prototype experiment was like a shocking, in a good way, experience to feel that, hey, this, there is an opportunity to be different. It doesn't have to be the way I was stuck in, I was trapped in before. And then the next thought after that was, well, if this is true, there must be other people like me. So I need to find a way to share this. So as we've been talking, you mentioned that uh, you know this this need to to share and to teach other people about this this new idea or this new insight that you had to an old idea of mm-hmm. of note taking. So how did it how did it evolve from the two thousand six two thousand seven in through two thousand nine and ten when you began you know sketch noting more live events and different things like that? Mm-hmm. Well, you know that first one was a good experiment. I thought it went well, but you know, with experiments, you have to do them multiple times to verify that they actually hold up. You know, I'm not a scientist, but I know that you have to repeat things and show that things will be repeatable. Uh, At least you have to do that knowing that I'm a a a tech guy. Like you can't go to uh, customer support unless you can verify that you can repeat a problem, right? Or else they'll, they'll just tell you to do it. So, (laughs) um, (laughs) yep. I felt like I had to do a bunch more of it. It was still in the skunk works phase, even though I was excited and I knew that I probably should share this. I did share those on Flickr, which was the hot social network at the time. I'm still a Flickr member and you can see my work there all the way going all the way back past that. Um, So I shared it and several of the speakers were actually on Flickr and really liked it. And then other people who were not at the event thought it was really cool that they could get sort of this condensed visual version of, a whole day of um, of stuff in a really concise way. So then, I, when I when I saw that happening, that's when I realized, okay, this is much bigger than just for me. I, but I need to I need to verify it. So I started using it at all the conferences, mainly that I was starting to attend. So the next one, I think, it was just after that in the springtime. The guys who run Basecamp now had a company at the time was called Thirty Seven Signals, and they paired up with um, Kudal Partners, who, if you don't know our partners with um, in the uh, Field Notes enterprise with Aaron, Aaron Draplin. So there's a connection there. Those guys knew each other. And they ran a conference um, with another guy named Carlos Segura, who I was a huge fanboy of when I was a young designer. He was like one of the cool designers that I followed. He just had amazing stuff. So it's kind of like all these really interesting people were throwing this event in Chicago and I could ride the train to it again. And I said, Oh, sounds like a really good opportunity to put this idea to the test. Let's verify and see if it really holds up the way I think it will, or maybe it won't. So I, again, I took my notebook. It it might've been the same notebook. I'm not, that's a good question. I probably could go back and look and went and attended that and had a really good time doing sketch noting again, the same kind of feelings came to me. The the being in the moment, sort of editing live, sort of capturing, being able to draw. And people sitting around me were really, really um, attracted to the work I was doing. I made a couple friends that I'm still friends with today. Um, and then shortly after that, published it. And the Kudal guys, Jim Kudal, found it. And he put it on their blog. And then 37 Signals posted it on their blog. And then it just took off from there. So that 
gave it some more m- more public momentum as a thing, I guess you would say. And then, you know, there was a few other events that I attended. And then I think the next thing, the next big one was South by Southwest Interactive down in Austin, Texas, in your, in your neck of the woods. And this is before I knew you. Mm-hmm. Um, I attended that event. And so I wanted to push it a little farther. So these were all one-day events I was attending, and it seemed to hold up pretty well. But I kind of thought, well, the, the next real test is, could it let, could I do this all week at South by? Um, and what would fail first, my hand or my brain? So I flew down to South by Southwest. Again, I took my notebook and my pen. And I think one of the things that shifted there because of the subject matter was I realized I could actually capture the things that were happening in between the events. So normally I was capturing speakers or panels or either the one-day events or at South by. But then I realized, you know, I'm sitting in the hallway because, you know, the thing I wanted to go to is full or it's on the other side of the campus or I'm just tired and observing people sitting around and at night we would go for dinner someplace with friends and so I would draw the food we were eating and it became much more of a capture of the whole started to become a capture of the whole experience not completely but a lot more than the initial work that was happening which is I guess seeds for where sketchnoting went you know in the future capturing food and ideas and travel and you know all that kind of stuff so that was happening and then, you know, South by got sort of wind of what I was doing. And I think another thing that, um, which people don't think about now, but was a huge benefit to sketchnoting at the time was something called Creative Commons. If you don't know what Creative Commons is, we'll have a link to it in the show notes. But basically, it's this idea. It was created by this guy named Larry Lessig, who's an attorney. And he realized uh, copyright was okay, but it was so restrictive. Like, if you just wanted to put a picture of something that someone made on your blog, you couldn't do it without emailing the person, right? Or else potentially getting sued. And he realized, well, if we can build frameworks where most of the control of the work is still held by the creator, but they release some aspects that benefit the internet, like posting images on your site, if they deem it, you know, with that license, they call it a license, that you could do that. So I I was really into that at the time. And uh, so I marked all my stuff Creative Commons with the with the capability for people who are bloggers or whatever to post it into their articles, and they did. So that really extended it even further, I think, than it might have gone. And then the South by people reached out to me and said, "Hey, we thought that stuff you did was pretty interesting. Would you, if we gave you a badge, would you come back and do that for us, and we'll promote it?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure. I would probably going to do it anyway. So I'll take your free badge." <laughs> and so, uh, so I went out and. You know, that it just kept the thing I think that's been interesting about this whole journey is I sort of started with one small thing and did some experimentation and it just kept leading to the next thing. And then the next thing would grow a little bit. And it wasn't like radically growing, it was like little, little uh, growth potential. So, I mean, they signed me to do this um, thing, they sent me a badge. And then, like, the I think it was like a week or two after they we agreed to this. They emailed me and said, hey, Mike, we got this problem. We need a bag that we need to give to 8,000 people. Um, we, know it's, we know it's sort of short notice. We know you're a designer, though, and an illustrator. Um, would you be open to giving us like a, like a drawing? You can have like eight colors, but we need it ne- like next week. Can you do that? I was like, uh, sure, why not? <laughs> so I took the job, and they told me I could go as, as many as eight colors or something. And so I, I read that as, I'm going to use all eight colors. So <laughs> <laughs> as a designer, when you've given me a, a border like that, I'm going to push it. So yep. I designed the state of Texas with uh, with handwritten, you know, my, my hand lettering style in all these different colors and did all the, they loved it because I did all the production work. I was a full print designer. So I knew what I was doing, and I basically turned in production level artwork that they just basically ran on these bags. So it was kind of weird that here I was hired to go around and like sketch note this week long event. And my bags are like over everybody's shoulders and um, lots of people, most people seem to really like them. They thought they were like something unique and different. And uh, a few people on Twitter made comments about how they really liked the bags. And I think there was one, uh, the, the other funny story, which not a lot of people know, and it's buried in my blog somewhere is, there's this designer, David Carson. If you're a designer, you might know who this is. He's um, he's like a surfer, and he was in California. Really, really strange, kind of funky design aesthetic. And um, he left a blog post on my blog, and like, 
and shredded it. <laughs> he said it was too, you know, too staid and expected or whatever. There was like all these comments and it was kind of funny because it was like, well, you know, not everybody's going to like it. It was an early, an early uh, warning that not everybody's going to like everything you do and that it's okay. So that happened next. And then that was right about that 2008, 2009-ish time where people started reaching out and saying, hey, um, would you, if we fly you out and put you up in a hotel and give you a few thousand dollars, would you come and, you know, sketch note our event? Like, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> so that was the next phase. You know, one of the great things about your Flickr account, and I'm sitting here looking at it right now, is you you catalog a lot of this early stuff. And if people mm-hmm. go to your go to your Flickr account and take a look in your albums, they'll be able to go back and see the things that you did. You know, for like South by Southwest in 2008 and 2009, uh, what you did for an event apart, you know, in mm-hmm. in 2008, and some of those other places that you've that you've sketch noted. But I want to fast forward a little bit to 2009. Sure. We're talking May of 2009. Mm-hmm. This is when the folks at uh, VizThink had you come out and do a webinar or do a webinar on sketch noting techniques. And one of the cool things about the album on 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 Flickr for this is you go over, you know, you hand wrote all of your slides of what you were doing in the planning phases for this. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really interesting going through and and seeing you, you know, start to not only test your ideas by by going to conferences and capturing what other people are saying but using this in your own professional work in capturing your own ideas and laying out your your thought process for this now i've had the the wonderful opportunity to to teach with you on several occasions and so i've been able to to watch your process firsthand so as you started to evolve this from from being an internal practice to being something that becomes external for viewers what was your process to take it external in a mode of teaching through these webinars and workshops? I remember that webinar. I was both excited and scared at the same time because I've never been trained as a teacher. I just naturally find ways that I think, like I think about how I, I, I like to be taught and I sort of build my curriculum and, and such around the way I think it makes sense. And I think a little bit too as being a designer and also you know, at the time, I wouldn't have called myself a user experience designer quite yet. Um, but I think I would always thought that way. I always thought about what's the person doing this going to want to get out of it, or what are they going to want to, what what will they want to achieve out of it? And so, from very early on, when I was doing this teaching stuff, I tried to think of like if someone's on like, I mean, it's not like now where this is pretty normal. Uh, it was pretty strange to do like an online conference back then the technology was really rudimentary and uh, there was I think there was all kinds of problems that we encountered but I just thought about what were the most basic ways I could share these ideas and I was heavily influenced by Dave Gray who I had a chance to interview him I was actually I re-listened to that whole episode with Dave Gray it's still really great because he talks about his path into visualization and the way he looks at things and um, Mm -hmm. so he really had a heavy influence on me so I think because Dave believed in me, I thought, well, if Dave believes in me and he's bringing me into this thing, and I guess I could probably do this. I should just uh, put my, be a designer and sort of act like I always do and figure it out. And so that's what I did. And it felt natural to me to uh, do this illustration stuff. I think one of the one of the slides in there is probably uh, something about a a mean third grade teacher or something like second, that. Second second grade, grade teacher. teacher. Yeah, so that's uh, that's from from a lived experience. Uh, I had a really mean second grade teacher who um, actually forced my parents to move me from one school to another when we were still in Chicago. So uh, I think that sort of uh, even the way she looks reminds me of uh, of that teacher in, in second grade who was so mean to me. And I just felt like you know how can I? The other thing you'll see is I wanted to bring in humor into teaching because. I felt like as I was starting to see teaching happening, it tended to be really straight laced and straightforward and no humor and all business. And it's like, come on, like, you know, life is short. Let's, why can't I sneak a little bit of humor in here to sort of break down things and uh, open you up? I've in that so that you can see that if you look through that deck as well. And it was just a really, really interesting time. And um, I think that actually led to us doing, uh, we did an event at South by Southwest with several of those same people in person, I think a year or two later, 2012, that... It uh, was 2013. Was it 2013? No, no, okay. no, you, you did a 2012, but then the one that I was there with you, that was 2013 when you yeah. came back. Yeah, so 
again, so you think about how these things built on each other. That's where I think I met Austin Cleon and Sonny Brown were involved in that with Dave. Mm-hmm. So that was an initial connection with those guys. And then, you know, we got together and did it live later. So, I mean, all these uh, relationships sort of happened around this as well. I think it was pretty influential. And again, it was, in some ways, I think it, the benefit was me not knowing what I was doing. So, like, being an author, I'd never been an author. I didn't know how you were supposed to do things other than having read books. But, like, all the back-end, behind-the-scenes stuff, I didn't know anything about that. So, I had to rely on my editors. And, you know, like, they would, you know, when we'd be sold out of the first batch of books, I'd say, is that good? It's like, yes, that's very good. (laughs) Usually, people don't sell enough to make the the advance. Like, they were really uh, excited. So, I just didn't have any baseline to judge whether this is good or bad. So I think I hear this a lot. Like people will talk about if I knew what I was in for, I maybe I wouldn't have done it. And I would say the same thing around the handbook work, which is a little bit later, but not too long after this, that had I known how much work the, that the handbook would be, I'm not sure if I would have signed up for it or not, you know, but it's the same with all these, like that Viz thing presentation was a lot of work. I spent mm-hmm. a lot of time on it, but I'm really proud of it. But in some ways, I kind of feel like you sort of have to get yourself into a pickle and then have to find your way out of it. And I think that's that can often be beneficial. And then not knowing how things are supposed to be frees mm-hmm. you up to make it in the way that makes sense to you, which might be actually pretty innovative without you realizing it. So one of the interesting things about the the, the process of, of moving from something personal to something external, where you're delivering it to groups of people, whether it's by a webinar or in a closed classroom, What was the impetus to actually get it to turn into a book? Where did that idea come from? And what was the process to get you from from point A to point B? Hmm. Well, it's interesting because I was practicing it. I was doing it. I think the Sketchnote uh, Army had begun uh, not too long before that. So that was happening. Um, I was doing these events where I was being hired to come in and do it. So I was was in the sort of the the practice. I was a practitioner. And then, so there were two people that, bothered me into it, I guess. One of them uh, was uh, Patrick Roan, who became a friend because uh, he really admired the work. And he's in Minneapolis, so he's about five hours away. And I visited and he kept bothering me like, Mike, you need to write a book about this. You need to write a, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. He just kept bothering me. And then I happened to be in Portland, Oregon for a conference, which I sketch noted, the Storyline Conference. And I met my friend Von Glitschka, who's a really famous... If you're a designer, you know, Von, he's kind of this nutty, fun guy who just like, I don't think he ever sleeps. I don't know how he, he produces so much stuff. He's amazing logo designer, icon designer, type designer, just amazing with Adobe Illustrator, just like this powerhouse. And so um, I had become friends with him and um, invited him to go out to dinner for Thai food with my wife and we had a great dinner and he kept bugging me like, Mike, you got to write a book. Cause he had been writing books by then, probably three, four books. Mm-hmm. And so, um, he said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to connect you with my, my editor, Nikki. And, um, I think this is a, this is a winning idea. I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to, I'm going to email her. And I didn't think anything of it. So they picked us up and dropped us off for this dinner. Cause they, they knew where they were going. We, we just, we didn't have a car in Portland. So they dropped us off at our hotel <laughs> and we went upstairs and I went into our room and I I think I had a phone at that point. So I, I fired up the email and an email came in and it was from Vaughn to Nikki. Like between the time we'd gotten out of the car and we had walked upstairs and gotten into the hotel room, Vaughn Glitschka, his wife was driving. He was sitting on a little laptop and he was like writing this email to to Nikki, <laughs> his editor, and had already like sent it out to her. And like that night she wrote back, I'm really interested. Let's talk about this when you get back home. So like it was like so fast. And then, you know, Nikki was really great about uh because I didn't know the process. Okay, here's what I need from you, here's when I need it, and walked me through all that stuff. And we did had lots of discussions about uh what she imagined it could be, like from her perspective, knowing publishing so well. Like I think she really wanted to do something unique and different that hadn't been done before. And she saw this opportunity to do that with me. Like I was like, Oh, this guy's opened everything that I'm thinking of. And he's got crazy ideas too. We should, we should go for it. And so we did. And actually there's an interview with uh, Nikki in the podcast. I'll put a link to that. 
season one, episode six. Yeah, so so Nikki uh, was definitely a huge influence in a lot of the ideas, but it was a collaboration. We had a really great team of people. But yeah, so it would be Patrick Roan and uh, and my crazy friend uh, Von Glitschka, Von. who were sort of the sparks <laughs> to make this book happen. And probably a lot of the credit goes to Von because, geez, he was like typing his editor on his way home in the car leaving our hotel, <laughs> which, you know, like now, you know, in our culture now, that's pretty normal. Like you can imagine somebody doing that, like riding an Uber and sending a met. But at the time, this is, you know, 2010, I think, or 2011, it was just kind of not that normal yet. And, you know, but, you know, that was the way it happened. And we, I just kept on making it past the gates. Nikki was fighting for me. And uh, it's funny because I asked her later, like, so how much of a risk was the book that we were pitching? Because, you know, Peach Pit is not known for, you know, visual thinking or sketch noting. Well, it didn't exist at the time. They were known for like Photoshop books and they would have to re- re-release them every six months because Photoshop got an upgrade. And they're really into this technical photography space. And, and she's like, well, actually, it was a pretty big risk for them to do it because you were a little bit unknown and the concept was unknown. But she said that at the time, Peach Pit really wanted to move into these evergreen publishing topics because they were they saw how like Photoshop went like every six months you got to shred it and start over again. They'd like to have be nice to have a book you wouldn't have to like redo every six months. And so they're really fascinated by the idea of an evergreen uh, concept book. So it fit those criteria. I think by then I'd done illustrations for uh, if you remember Jason Fried and David Heinemar Hansen at. 37 Signals, now Basecamp, had hired me to do illustrations for Rework, which is a really good selling book. And there were a few other book projects in there as well. So I had that reputation, like, okay, he can deliver big projects and meet deadlines and people are hiring him to do this. So that probably helped. But it was a little bit of a risk for uh, Peach Pit. But, you know, as you get into the book business, you find out it's it's a lot more like um, Silicon Valley um, uh venture capital then you realize like they sort of just produce tons of books and only like a few of them really hit and pay for the rest it's really crazy but that's sort of the that's sort of the publishing game so one of the things that you and nikki had talked about in that episode um was the idea of making you know having having published books myself and and having to work with editors you know everything is just text 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 Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. a few figures here and there and if the text is good the first thing to go are the figures but you fought for the sketch note uh handbook to be something to look like it is a sketch note itself where Mm -hmm. every page is hand drawn you developed a typeface you know to be used in the book so it had that originality and you know i've got dozens upon dozens of visual note taking and sketch noting books but yours is unique as it 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 practices what it, it it practices what it preaches how hard was it to to fight with them to to let you do each page by hand well i think a lot of that credit goes to nikki she fought for me um, I think she had enough weight to like people trusted her taste to know like what was good and let her be. <laughs> and, you know, then she, I think she sort of sensed like because of the books that I'd done and I, she knew my reputation, like I'd spent 10, 12 years as a print production designer. So I knew how to do production work. I hadn't done it for a while, but I knew I could do it. Like I wasn't afraid of it. So um, having me, like she really fought for me to do the illustration. I got like a, I got a chunk of money to do that work. It was when you look at the work I put in, it was probably not worth the money, really. But I didn't look at it as like it was basically it paid for me to burn the time a little bit, but a lot of it was about control. Mm-hmm. So if I look back at the whole book project, um, the reason I think it went so well, and I mean we can't we couldn't control the selling of it. Like you can make a great book and nobody can buy it, right? That can happen. You know, we had a vision for it from the beginning. Nikki really had a vision and actually drew it out of me a lot. So there was a lot that that she saw in me and saw the potential of what we could do and sort of guided me in those directions uh, and helped me. And then we had total control over everything. So, you know, we started by writing. I wrote the whole Spanish script first, and then we got it edited till it sounded good. And then I took the manuscript and I did thumbnails the way I do every design project, and I had 
pages and pages of thumbnails. I had a template that I built. I sketched every single page. And like, if you go through the sketches and compare them, they're actually not too far off from the actual work. And then from the, from those basically pencil wireframes that guided me into what illustrations I needed and how the text would fit and where the, if I was looking for samples from other people or spreads from other sketch noters, where I would, where I would need them. And I was, I was really tight on that. I tried to like, uh, designed it right down to the page. So I knew exactly where everything was going to fit. So it made it easy, right? Like all that front end work that I did to sort of think through it in the pencil stage meant that when I got to illustration, I would just go thumbnail after thumbnail. Okay. I need that one. I would draw that thing. And then I, well, I need this and I'd draw that. I'd do all these illustrations kind of in a batch and then scan them all in and, and build them in Photoshop. So having that control all the way from writing the text to illustrating to getting rights and getting people's work in high resolution and doing all the production work and, and doing all that stuff right up to handing the files over to the printer was really satisfying because, I mean, it's sort of scary too, right? Because you can't just say, well, you know, if the designer was better, my book would have been better. It's like, you can't blame anybody. You did everything <laughs> from the front to the back. If it's wrong, it's it's on us. Like if it's, it's a typo, all you. Yep, it's all <laughs> on us. And it's, that can, you know, you can look at that two ways. You can look at that as being a little bit scary, but in a lot of ways it's uh, empowering, right? Because if you pull it off, it's like, this is really cool. And I think the other thing you you realize too, me being a designer, right? I, I'd been on the back end of producing stuff that when you have that total control from end to end, you, you're more likely to achieve your vision and make it look like it appeared in your head or you hope that it would appear than if you hand it over to somebody else who's not as invested, right? Because, you know, they're just not going to go to the degree and notice the little details that, that you will. So I think that um, that whole thing was had to do with um, just the control of the whole thing from end to end that made it possible. And that's how we, you know, the openness to me producing a typeface. Because I knew as a production designer, I did not want to be handwriting pages because there's going to be typos and changes and um, my hands would be totally useless for months <laughs> if I had to had to write everything. So it made sense to do a typeface and that made, you know, it was, you know, all those production design things were sort of built into the design because I knew what I, because I knew I was going to do the production work, you know, I sort of built it in the way that made sense knowing that I would do that, right? So it, everything sort of lined up almost like a puzzle and that made it possible to pull off in nine months because it was pretty crazy when I look back and think, you know, we did a book written, illustrated, uh, organized production delivery in nine months. And we took all the same concepts and shot a 90 minute video with scripting and on-site shooting and all this crazy stuff. We did all that too. Like that was all part of it. So it was like a really intense nine months that, you know, you sort of forget when it's, it's great when it's over. Cause you can, you can sort of enjoy, uh, the benefits, but during was really hard um, but you know, it was, it was fun in its own way. I guess you have to be a masochistic uh, production designer to think that's fun. Right. But, um, it's sort of like you get in the flow and you just want to keep going. Like you sort of want to keep moving, even though it's painful. It's just a weird, weird to describe to someone who hasn't been through it, but yeah, it, it was a really good experience. So one of the things I appreciate about the Sketchnote handbook is that it has other voices in it. It's not it's not just the Mike Rohde show. It features over a dozen other visual note takers and illustrators. How did you go about curating and contacting those folks? And one of our common friends, uh, Mark Sup- or Paul Supase, uh, mm-hmm. is was one of the is one of the people within it, and even uh, Creighton Berman and Evalata Lam and mm-hmm. and uh, Boon Chu. How did you how did you find them? How did you contact them and get them to participate within this book? Well, I think I have to say I was I benefited from being a practitioner. So that's where the practitioning is that a word practitioning? Practitioning came uh in handy because I was out there seeing other people's work and seeing what they were doing and being aware of other people doing it. In one of my early talks that I ga- that I've that I gave, it was a Pachachka talk where the slides move and you don't have control one of the sort of the crisis point in there was I started noticing all these other people doing my thing. And it was kind of like, am I going to fight for this and make it my thing and like tell everybody to stop it? Or am I going to think about this as a community thing? And I just felt like right away, like, wait a minute, 
I, I did this because it solved the problem. It, I was, it solved the pain for me. Why in the world would I ever stop somebody else from doing this? That's insane. Um, so that moment was sort of the shifting point where then I was becoming friends with these people and encouraging them and being aware of what they were doing. So when it came time for the book, you know, the sketch note army had been around for a while and I'd seen all this work. I'd published a lot of their work on sketch note army. So I was aware with aware of them. I had their emails. So it was pretty easy to come back and say, Hey, I really like the work you're doing. Would you like to do a spread in the book? And you know, everybody asked, said yes. And, the other thing was I was identifying work that I wanted to have in the book that fit with the vision of what we were producing. So again, that's where those those little uh, thumbnail sketches and the wireframes we did in pencil help because I knew what the theme was. I need a piece of art right here, and it need and it needs to be about this and that. Oh, that's a perfect one, that perfect one from such and so. And then I would just reach out and say, Hey, I I saw this pieces on Flickr or whatever can I use this in the book? I'm like, yeah, sure. So I'd send them a Word document, they'd sign it and, and, it, and it would go. So I think having done it for a while helped. Like if I had not done all that pre-work and tried to do the book, it would have been a challenge. And it was a like clearing rights is no fun because you got to get a document from the publisher and you got to bug them and they got to sign it. And, you know, later for the second book, having signature tools made it tons easier. I think I did it, what I did in a week and a half and like an afternoon it was insane. So, but it's still a lot of work to like identify and get rights. And then you got to get production quality work, like good photos. I think having all that experience and being, uh, practicing and knowing my community really benefited me when it came time to pull that work. Cause I knew exactly, Oh, I want this. This needs to be this person. Cause I know they do this and you know, that kind of stuff. You know, the sketch note, the sketch note handbook is going to be eight years old. You know, it's been around for eight years. It's floated in and out of people's lives. It's in and out of bookstores. It's had gads of printings in seven languages now. Yeah, I think it's seven. How, how has that impacted, impacted you knowing that this book, you know, you were talking earlier about how Nikki, you know, they wanted to have something evergreen that would go for a while. And here it is eight years later and it's still being printed and it's still being translated into other languages. How does that impact you as its creator? Well, it's really exciting because, you know, you, like I said, you put so much work into something, you put a lot of love into something and you hope that it's beneficial to others, but you want it to be relevant, right? We tried the best we could to make it, um, you know, stay relevant for a long period of time. So on that level, it's really great to see that it, it achieved what we aimed for. Like all the things that we did to make it uh, evergreen. Like we didn't put lots of emphasis on technology. We talked a lot about principles and concepts and the whys and the, you know, philosophies, which would transcend whatever technology would come after, you know, and that's, that has been beneficial. And then seeing, you know, that it's appearing in these other languages, it, German and French and Russian and Czech and Ukrainian and Vietnamese and Chinese, like all these languages means that it's reaching people who I may never meet, right? It's going to have an influence on those people. That's really exciting. And then, you know, even today, there's people who are just discovering it eight years later. It's like the eight-year overnight sensation, right? You hear hear about the 10-year overnight sensation for like the Beatles, you know, 10 years in Hamburg before they made it big or all these other, I mean, if you look back at successful stories, it's kind of the same story. It's eight to 10 years of grind and then, you know, suddenly you're aware. So, you know, it's a real joy when I go on Twitter and someone says, oh, I just, I just found this book and I love it. And I'm just learning how to use this in my, in my life, or I'm teaching it to my students because I'm a teacher, right? Like the fact that it's still working eight years later and it's helping people, that's really super satisfying as a creator. Because to give you some context, as a designer, a lot of what we that a lot of what I did, I speak for myself, is, you know, it comes and it goes. It's a brochure. It's an annual report. Maybe if you're lucky, you got to design someone's book, but I didn't do very many books other than illustrations until later in my career, right? So a lot of my stuff ended up being, you know, it was uh, read in the morning and, you know, training the dog in the afternoon, right? So mm-hmm. a lot of the work you do, even like, and it's even worse for online stuff, right? Websites that you design, you know, you're lucky if it lasts two, three years and it's been redesigned and it's gone. So your work, it just sort of, 
it just sort of doesn't exist anymore, right? It's unless you capture it in some way. So having something that has lasting power in this generation uh, where everything seems to shift all the time is really satisfying and makes it feel worth um, all the effort and the and the pain and the joy that it took to make it, I think. So, you know, since this has impacted so many people from around the world, I want you to think if there is one story you've heard from from one reader, from one listener that has really kind of helped you to realize that this is a good thing. Hmm. Well, there's a lot of those, but there's one that comes jumps right to mind when you talk about this. And it's a woman who um, was another podcast, um, Laura Kazan, uh, reached out to me out of the blue one day. I got this email and uh, it was Laura saying that her son had all these ADHD and all these challenges that he faced to learning, right? It made it really difficult. He had something called dysgraphia, which means that the word, I think the words that he reads kind of look like gray blobs, like he can't process it properly, however technically that works. But he had all these challenges that he had to overcome just to be like every other kid. And he discovered with his teacher sketchnoting and the book and started to use it. And, you know, he was just using a pencil and paper. He wasn't even like, he hadn't gotten to the point of using pen, but the concept, the principle, the idea that you could draw your thinking broke through. And the kid, I think, is now going to college. Like his mom never thought his son was, her son was going to go to college because of all these limitations and like doing sketch noting and reading the book sort of opened this up for her son. Like, I mean, how, how much more impactful can you ask for than a kid who probably would have been, you know, gone to high school and then who knows what now has an opportunity, you know, it, with adaptations and accommodations and all the things that are now available for a college student, you know, the kid's smart. He just has lots of challenges that he's got to overcome just to be like the average college student. So, you know, that using visuals and sketch noting help him. Like, I mean, he went from trying to write notes while he would listen to a lecture and taking nothing away to doing sketch noting and remembering and being able to repeat like even days later, the concepts, like he was actually comprehending and remembering concepts that he wasn't remembering in the other ways he was practicing. So that, that was a, that kind of caught me uh, and sort of woke me up that I think it was Sunday morning when I got that email and I was kind of floating on cloud nine for probably two weeks after that, just every time I think about it, because that's what you do it for, right? You, it solved my pain, but how could I have ever known that it would have solved this kid who, you know, might not have gone to college if it wasn't for this, for me, like putting in the work, right? That's, that's a, that's a circle of, uh, appreciation that you can see like, okay, now all the pain I've gone through and all the joy and all that stuff, that's, this is what I'm doing it for. And that's exciting. You know, as I sit here and, and think about the individuals that have been impacted uh, through your work with this book and the, I don't want to call it a revolution, but just a phenomenon, a, a, a spreading around the world of this this concept that everyone can take notes a different way to, to share in what you have discovered without having to feel all the pain, <laughs> you know, that, that went into into figuring this out. So, you know, it, it, it appeals to not only individuals, but also to communities. And you and I have been a part of many different sketchnoting communities mm-hmm. um, in the last, you know, five, six, seven years. How has that, has that, has that rested upon you yet that there are so many people out there that this book has affected and had them start up groups here and groups there and, and even have not only neighborhood hangouts or, you know, statewide, uh, you know, conferences with speakers to national conferences to international uh, get togethers and bar camps. How has this settled on you? Hmm. Well, I, you know, um, the, the story I just told you before about this boy who didn't think he was going to go to college, that's one aspect that I'm really proud of. And I would say the one that I knew pretty immediately because it happened pretty much immediately was the community aspect mainly because there was kind of of a, of a proto community that already was building. So like the reason I did sketch note army was I felt like there were a lot of people kind of doing it, but there was no place you could sort of find it and see all the people in one place. So I thought, well, it's maybe I should just make that. So I did, 
right? So there was starting to be a community building. We sort of had awareness of each other, mainly on Twitter, I think was sort of the first place. And now it's sort of shifted a little bit more toward, you know, Instagram. Um, but so I think that sort of foundation helped a lot. And then there was just sort of a moment. I think one of the ones was when you reached out and said, hey, would you come and teach this stuff? for my AIGA chapter in San Antonio. I was like, yeah, this is awesome. So, you know, I took my son and we visited you and taught that. And those things started happening more. And I started to realize like, okay, there's a community part of this. And I really like that. That's always been a mission of mine. You can even see it in the book, right? The whole reason that I didn't want it to be the Mike Rody show. And I wanted to have other people in there is because I wanted someone to be able to look at it and say, I, I, well, if I can't identify in Mike because he's trained as a, a designer, I can, you know, identify in the work of uh, Jessica Esch, who's a librarian, or, you know, somebody else who's not an artist. Like, oh, okay, well, then I can do this, right? It had to be a community thing because there's so many different perspectives. And I, I'm sort of a believer of the more voices that you have that are sharing an idea, the more um, verified, I guess, going back to, we talked about verifying my experiments. Like it's another verification or a, I don't know what the right word is, but it sort of verifies to me that, um, that the idea is bigger than just a person. It's, um, like you said, like a, maybe it's a movement, maybe it's a, you know, a shift in thinking that is available to a whole community of people and that it can be interpreted. Like that's the most joyful thing is like when I hear like, Rob DeMio telling his story of how he he adapted it to physics because you couldn't just roll into a physics lecture or a scientific lecture and just do sketch notes, right? It was way too technical. So he found a way to adapt it. And I've heard this over and over again for people in different spaces who, because it was based on principles and not so rigid that it could be adaptable to these other situations. And I think that's a real testament to community as well, that people felt confident enough in the community that they could contribute and they could have a voice. And now there's tons of people that are not only doing this stuff, but also teaching it, which is really exciting. Something I've definitely promoted in the international sketchnote camps that people need to be in their spaces teaching it because, you know, a few of us can't be everywhere. It's much better if uh, lots of us are in little places and we have an impact. And that's, I think the community is probably the thing I'm most proud of, of all the things that came out of it. And I think I think the word you're looking for is validation. Validation. You know, there you go. To to go through and have it validate. You know, because of you and and because of reading your book and and taking that to heart. You know, I was able to build a course on it, and through that course, I was able to teach other students. And I've had students who have created workshops for other groups, and that has just perpetuated and rolled through. And you know, in your in your teaching. Um, you've taught many different kinds of, of groups. I remember you and I were in Washington, D.C., you know, teaching workshops in the basement of a hospital. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and you came out here and was just up north near Austin, you know, teaching a workshop of a bunch of K through 12, you know, teachers, uh, tables and tables full of teachers yeah. <laughs> wanting to know about how they can go through and grab their students' attention and help give them a tool that just might, might help them. I've sat across the table from you in both Germany and in in uh, in Portugal, where I have watched and observed you talking to people from all over the world about the wonderful ideas that they've come up with mm. and the ways that it has impacted their communities and helped them. And in some cases, people who have picked up this book have built careers and means of gainful employment uh, around this concept that. It, it, it was a spark, let's call it a spark, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that kind of ignited uh, different pockets of heat in different people throughout the world, you know, motivating some to create, like I said, you know, uh, online groups and support groups there. And especially in this COVID time that we're in, you know, we've had to, to postpone different events and, and meet online in, 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 smaller, in smaller batches. And here in a couple of weeks, you've got uh, a lettering workshop um, mm-hmm. you know coming up with 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 folks that I, I just think that the that the community aspect of this is so important and and just really helps to to lend you know the 
the capturing of ideas because you know you're right right there in, in the book in the first few pages it's about ideas not art mm-hmm. um and that's the sticker on the other side of my <laughs> of my <laughs> microphone over here um as we as we go through that so you know it has not only a local appeal but this global appeal um you know with this book being eight years old you know just a little bit just a little bit younger than your than your son um you know d- does this almost seem like a child to you something that you've been able to to watch grow yeah i think it that's a really good way to describe it uh, almost like a child and, and it sort of um becomes clear because our son you know landon was born a month or something before i turned in the final work so you know, we, I was very aware of uh, birthing <laughs> in many ways, right? Birthing of a child and birthing well, of you, a Well, you, you did say you had nine months to put this book together. Yeah, so. isn't that funny? <laughs> nine months and all these sort of parallels between birth, right? So, um, yep. yeah, I think it sort of has a life of its own. I think uh, I'm a big fan of Seth Godin. There's a couple things he says. One is, once you turn uh, work into the world, it's not yours anymore. So, in some ways, it belongs to the community, right? Like, um, I don't really look at reviews anymore because I really can't change them. I'm not going to argue with anybody. They can feel what they feel. I mean, it gets good reviews. But um, the other thing, too, that I remember that Seth, when I first discovered Seth Godin, I think it was um, Unleashing the Idea Virus. It's a book right around 2000. And his basically his premise was, if you have a really good idea, uh, you're not going to be able to stop it. If you release it to the world, it's going to take off and it will continue and there won't be much you can do to stop it. And I think now that I look at, you know, I sort of structured a lot of things I did around what he taught uh, around, you know, creative commons. There's an aspect of, you know, openness, telling people to, you know, learn how to teach it to their own communities, like all this where you're enabling other people to move it forward, then it can have the power and the energy to move forward because the people have something invested in it, you know, that benefits them and, you know, and they know it's benefiting others. And I think that's really a really a big key to why the book has done well for all the unknowns that we had when we started it. Like we, we kind of knew UX designers and designers in general would probably buy it, but that's a limited, (laughs) somewhat limited audience, right? Like, uh, we didn't know that teachers would, you know, years later discover it and find it really valuable. So, you know, it continues finding new audiences. And I don't know who the next audience might be uh, who discover it, but it's really great that it's um, able to suit them. And I think a lot of what, a lot of the work we put into it and the way we structured it and the way we promoted it and a lot, all the community work around it is what made it successful um, along with, probably a lot of luck too that timing and demand and interest all lined up in a good way but i think a lot of the work we did to structure it gave it a little more acceleration so yeah it's it is satisfying in a way to see it growing up i guess you know my book is now in second grade so i can't wait to see (laughs) when it graduates high school right in 10 years (laughs) so you know talking about uh you know one thing leading to the next how did the success of the Sketchnote handbook lead into its little brother, the trusty orange Sketchnote workbook? Hmm. Well, I had a lot of stuff we could not fit into the book. Um, we had sort of a page count we were trying to hit and a price, and you find out that these are all stuff that publishers think about a lot. We also wanted to focus it on what we felt was most practical to kind of reduce the risk. We knew people are more likely to use the concepts in sketchnoting conferences, right? So if you look at that first book, it emphasizes a lot talks and conferences and meetings and such. And we don't really go into too much beyond that. But I had, as the book was being built, I was experimenting with stuff like sketchnoting food and travel and ideation and like all these other things, capturing processes like recipes or how things are built all kinds of experiences. You did some work in that book around TV shows. So like media, right? There were all these ways that this concept really applied beyond just meeting notes, right? And I felt like that was a story worth being told. And the publisher was also very interested in telling that story. They felt like there was demand. And so we proceeded to to do that and expand the concept a little more. And I think actually in a lot of ways, when teachers ask me, which book should they start with? I sort of, I often if I go see teachers, I'll bring that one because basically we encapsulate the whole, I mean, at a super high level in the first chapter, we encapsulate the handbook in the first chapter. 
And then we go into application. And I think teachers are always looking for like, how can I apply these ideas in a practical way? And having a book like that where it was all about practicality and about application and ways to use the concept just seemed like a natural fit for teachers. So that was really the idea behind it. And it's not sold quite as well as the handbook. I think the handbook's a little more iconic, but it's it's earned its advance and it continues to sell. So there is some interest in it. It's just that, you know, the handbook is just such a a unique animal that it's it had kind of a head start. So, you know, it's may never catch up to it. We'll see. I think that what's interesting about the the sketch note workbook, um, you know, you started the the sketch and army um website in well you actually registered the domain name for the sketch and army, army uh, website on november 30th wow. of 2009 so you know that's kind of you know interesting that uh, november 30th keeps hanging over wow. over and over mm-hmm. but i think what was really interesting about the handbook is the handbook opened up the idea to the world and the workbook kind of captured the work from the world mm-hmm. because if you look at the examples that are in the sketch note workbook of, of which i have a part of you know you've got other folks um mm-hmm. that came in from like chris balton you know he's got a couple of things right. uh, that are in there and and others who have have come through it's kind of cool to see kind of how the handbook kind of exploded but then the workbook kind of brought those things back together mm-hmm. to see a culmination mm-hmm. of what had happened in the in the year so to speak since because you know the book the book came out November 30th of 2012 and the workbook didn't come out until 2014 mm-hmm. and you know you had the time before that so just in that in that initial year of being able to learn and and meet so many different people and if there's one thing that i've always loved about you is you don't forget anybody (laughs) you know (laughs) everybody who comes and talks to you you have that personality that you remember them and you and you tell their story and you continue to tell their stories so how do you feel about your story being told by other people well it was kind of weird at first to be you know to be an author to be you know looked up to and all these kind of things like you know, I have to tell you, like, it was, the funny story was, and this is probably in another podcast, after the first um, International Sketchnote Camp, <laughs> when when uh, Gail was there, I just remember people were coming up and saying, oh, I got this, I got to talk with Mike Rohde, and my wife was kind of rolling her eyes, like, okay, he's not that great, <laughs> but she was like, wow, you're like a rock star here. I was like, well, you know, rock star in a teapot is what I like to say, but it definitely was something I had to get used to that was... You know, my nature is, you know, Midwestern, humble, it's, you know, practicality, like all those things are part of who I am. So it took a little while to get used to that, but, you know, I've accepted, I think it's important. I'm fulfilling a role uh, that I need to play just a lot like, you know, like an elected official. I mean, I'm not elected, but, you know, elected officials, it's a role, it's a, it's a, a role that they play and they play it for a period of time and then someone else plays the role. So, I mean, that could happen in the future where someone else takes that banner and i think i like to think of it as there's lots of people that are taking the banner like i'm not the only one anymore i kind of like being in a community where a lot of people have different perspectives and it's just kind of fun to see how how this idea like twists and turns and what people can do with it that's really to me that's exciting and fun and not scary at all like seeing what people cook up with this concept is really fun for me because you just you know you get up in the morning you just don't know what somebody else is going to do with it and how exciting it is for them and how many people they can reach and stuff I would have never thought of. Right. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a lot more like teamwork, right? When you do something as a solo, uh, like a solo, um, athlete, there's certain things you can do, but when you work as a team, it sort of elevates, you can do a lot more as a team than you can as an individual. And I think that's sort of the position that I find myself in as sort of a, a leader of this movement and being able to see how we as a team of people, can have an impact on society because ultimately that's what my goal is, is teaching people that they have the capability to do some level of visualization more than they're doing now. And if I can assist them to do that, that's really what it's, what it's really all about. Not so much, you know, I mean, selling books is great and, you know, earning money doing this is really fun, but I do it because I love to do it and I love to see people's lives changed, you know? So that's, that's really at the heart of what I'm, what I'm, I'm about and what I'm up to. So, with the Sketchnote Handbook being eight years old, you know, it's two years away from being here for a decade. Um, what is your hope for this over the next two years? Hmm. Well, hopefully that it still remains relevant, 
that people see it as something that can be gifted. So, I mean, I, th- I think it's a good gifting thing for students, like students who you think might be interested in using visualization or who do it. A lot of what I hear too, the other thing I hear from people is, oh, I've been doing this for years and I never knew what to call it. So I think it was really important that it had a name, a name that was catchy and described what it was and that could be relatable in an instant. And it's sort of, you come back to validation for people that do it to think you're a weirdo. I'm the only weirdo that does this drawing thing in my notes or I got scolded in school because I doodled. Right now it's some suddenly because, oh, there's sketch noting and people do this for a living and they get paid for it. Well, it must be okay then. And now it opens the door. It's sort of... Uh, leaves some space for people who might otherwise have been afraid of it to feel like, oh, this is a safe space and these people are encouraging and maybe I'll try this thing. So that's that's what I hope is that it continues to impact people and make um, improvements in their lives. And I guess, I mean, if it's possible in a decade to have like a serious impact in education where education starts to integrate sketch noting as part of the curriculum at a high level, I mean, it's happening kind of grassroots so it's coming up from the bottom typically teachers will get excited they'll teach about it they'll badger their (laughs) that's how i got jobs when i would come in is they would badger their principal into bringing me in and teaching the whole group of teachers how to do this stuff and what it was like so to see this become part of uh, a major curriculum in schools would be really satisfying in 10 years i don't know if that's possible but if I could wish for something, I think that would be what I would wish for. So you and I know the history of the Sketchnote handbook and the Sketchnote workbook, and it was meant to be a trilogy. It was meant to be having a, a, a third step, and, and you've discussed this in other podcasts and in other places of, around, the, around the world. I've heard you talk about it many, many times. When it comes to what's next, what's next? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you're right. So the third book was um, 30 Days to Better Sketch Noting was the concept. We had a signed agreement with Peach Pit and they shifted in a different direction. And, you know, part of it too was I realized that the previous two books had been made from work that I'd been living with for a long time. And it was just a matter of capturing it. Uh, the 30 day book was something I hadn't been living with for a long time. And I would have had to make it. And it would have been. You know, looking back, like it probably was good that it got canceled because it would have been a very stressful nine months or whatever the time period would have been. And some other people are have done some of that kind of work, and which is fine. Um, but I think what I've learned since then is what's next is more one-on-one teaching. And you're starting to see more courses that are appearing, and I think those are good. I personally like the idea of live teaching. It's, uh, it's a little bit more challenging. You as a teacher would probably relate to this, right? Mm-hmm being forced to be on and interactive in a group of people and knowing that uh, there's people watching and it's a little bit of a a performance in some ways. And I kind of like that. I think that it makes it more fun because things could go wrong. And then the challenge is, well, if things go wrong, how would I, how do I get my myself out of this jam? Right. And to reveal that to people who are watching and see how I solve problems, I think is I'm at the, at a point in my career where I'm okay with that. (laughs) And people seeing me make mistakes and then how I recover, because that is actually maybe the best kind of education, right? To see how you recover from something that didn't quite go right can be even more valuable than something you plan and structure and organize, right? So so I'm really into this idea of a live workshop. You mentioned there's one coming up on December 5th and lettering is sort of a sweet spot. I love it. Uh, and I've taught this a little bit and I'm improving this course and I just feel like if uh, I give two hours live, it just brings people in so they become engaged. One of the challenges I see with a lot of online courses, and we're probably identifying this now more than ever with people being online for everything, but the problem with online courses is so many people, there's no accountability around it. You know, you do, you get through, you know, step four and you just quit because nobody can tell you you should do five or six or finish and who's, who's ever going to know. And I think in a lot of cases, not all cases, but in many cases, you know, people that make courses, you know, maybe don't realize how ineffective they can be, right? That people are bailing out. And I know Seth Godin talked about, he did some courses with Udemy and 
the people that ran the courses came back to him and said, oh, Seth, your stuff is doing great. There's like a 25% retention rate or whatever. And he's like, 25%? Like, that that should be like 90%. What's going on? Like, you know, it's like uh, mail open rates if you run a mailing list. Like, if half the people open it, it's like radically awesome, right? Like, half the people threw it away, right? <laughs> or didn't open mm-hmm. it or didn't care. So, you know, it's the law of numbers. But like Seth, I'm much more interested in teaching for impact, so to produce a course that just people go through step three out of 20 and don't finish doesn't seem that attractive. So I've really shifted in this direction of doing more live type events where there's interaction and Q&A and stuff and then recording it. And now it becomes a static thing. So if you're the kind of person that likes to watch at your leisure and stop and pause and rewind, then it sort of does both of those things. It's got the live component, which is kind of a performance and requires you know a different kind of focus and then it produces something that can be um viewed later so that's really interesting right now and i think um this opportunity to sort of teach the stuff that to me feels like normal i realize that there's probably a lot of stuff that i do that i just do normally but that many people would uh, benefit from if i could unpack it and sort of describe what i'm doing for them um so that's where I think the next focus is, is like f- identifying what are the things that people want? What are the things that I do that I can show them and then, you know, unpack and slow it down and reveal what's happening so they can assimilate it and then apply it in their own lives. That That's, again, really exciting to see people taking ideas from me and then applying them in a way that makes sense to them. So I'm going to take this in a little bit of a spin because there's a, a, a correlation between things that have you know, as, as you talk, you start to connect dots in your mind. And, and, and follow me on this. We have the sketchnote handbook in November of 2012. We have the sketchnote workbook in August of 2014. And we get the sketchnote army podcast in the spring of 2016. Mm. Just two years later from that. Mm-hmm. So to kind of... Not to cannibalize on its own thing, but do you think that the Sketchnote Army podcast was an extension of of collecting people and bringing their ideas together and, and putting them into a format that the world could listen to? I think it does. Um, for a long time, I wanted to do a podcast, and I never really had good content. Like, I could talk about my own stuff, and I was boring myself, so I stopped, right? It was fun to experiment with, um, but the content wasn't compelling. And even when we did that, when Mauro and I did the first Sketchnote Army podcast, we just sort of did it as an experiment. Again, we go back to the first thing I did was an experiment. Like we wanted to do a podcast. We both had these brand new iPads and pencils, and we just wanted to talk to somebody about it. So we got on, uh, you know, got on a Skype call and recorded it. And the co- audio quality was bad. And but for a long time, that was still one of the best, the most listened to episodes. And so it was like an experiment at first for us to talk and uh, give a voice to Mauro, who I think the thing I've realized, and I've said this a bunch of times on the show, is because we work in a visual medium, um, we see people's work all the time, and not everybody is great on wants to be on camera. So you don't always hear them talking about why they did things or what they're into. You know, you probably see imagery. Um, so in some ways, this provides the deeper experience of that person. And, you know, the funny thing is, is when we started this, I, in my mind, I was thinking, well, okay, we got a podcast about visual thinking. Like, who's going to want to listen to that? That seems crazy, but people did. And then the next thought was, well, what if I run out of people to interview? And like, within the first season, I was like, okay, I'm never going to run out of people to interview. <laughs> so that 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 objection is gone. And then from there, it was kind of like, well, let's have some fun with this. Let's, let's uh, really go... Let's find people that are well known and then sort of push off into spaces in adjacent areas like, you know, brain, uh, game storming or comics or all these other adjacent spaces that is visual thinking, but maybe sketch noters are just not as aware of. So why don't we expose people to that? So um, I think in a lot of ways, you're right. It sort of was the extension of the two page spread in the handbook, right? Where I give, uh, talked about Paul Supase, he's got the two page spread where he has this really cool layout with sketchnoting stuff in there. Like this was like the next rev of it, right? Where you actually hear somebody talking about the work they're doing and what's exciting and their experience and how they ended up in this space, which, you know, 
in the individual is the universal, right? So there's this universal uh, story that exists for people that listen. And you can get inspiration from people that came from strange places and ended up doing this and find it really valuable. If you're not sure, like, I don't know, I'm should I integrate this into my work life? And then you hear someone who's doing it and it's really valuable to them. And it might be the just that spark that moves you forward to do it, right? That's really that's really exciting. So yeah, that's that's an interesting connection that you've made that I didn't really think about. So another connection, if we just jump about the same amount of time forward, I think we have the true successor to the Sketchnote uh, workbook in the Sketchnote Idea Book. Mm, yep, yep. That was. Um, I, I'm I'm continuing to sort of pursue what feels like the next thing. So the handbook started it. The workbook sort of gave it expansion. The podcast gave it voice. And then, you know, the Sketch Not Idea book was just, again, I came back to frustration. Like, there's lots of books out there. Some are good at this part, and they're not as good at that part. And they're good at this part, and not as good at that part. Like, you know, from my perspective, what if I could put all those good things into one book and, you know, really tune it and provide some reference in there? And I was heavily inspired by uh, Ryder Carroll and his book for the Bullet Journal, which uh, if you read his story, that was supposed to be <laughs> that was supposed to be like a special thing for only a few people if they gave a certain amount of money so he could redo his website. And it turned into like the primary thing that most people wanted was the book, right? So that's a lot of what runs his business now. And uh, I've got Ryder's book over here in my bookshelf with everything else. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> From everywhere around the world. You know, we, we've talked about a, a, a lot um, in the last hour. Well, we've been talking a lot longer than that. <laughs> um, but, you know, at, at the at the end of it all, I've been able to see how people have, have taken this book and how they've, they've used it and how they've learned from it. Um, I've given over a dozen of them as gifts in the last eight years so you know and i've even made several of my classes required to get it <laughs> you know for the the courses that i've taught but i think it's been it's been a, a a really good impact on on lots of different people from all walks of life all levels of education and i don't know it just it it, it, it becomes a, a, a truly awe-inspiring thing that can really help to, to change someone's perspective on, on how to do something as mundane as, as note-taking hmm. as it might be perceived. And you might be glad to know that, that you know, my wife has re recently returned to school, and uh, she came to me the other day, and she goes, guess what? I actually drew some pictures <laughs> with my notes. <laughs> All right. And I'm just like, all right, one more person on that bandwagon mm -hmm. to to take this a little bit further and even see my own kids, you know, start to, to doodle and start to put different pictures and their ideas uh, in their notes and, and how that just grows. And, and, you know, one of the things I've heard you say to people within your workshops and in your teaching sessions is it's a sketch note. It's not all sketches. It's not all notes. It can be any percentage of either. If it's 90% words and 10% images, at least there's something in there that mm -hmm. can help people to, to remember something and to catch that idea and to, and to bring that back. And so I think that, that what the Sketchnote Handbook has been for the last eight years is, like I said, that spark. That thing that people look at and pull off the shelf and take a look at and go, huh, maybe I'll learn something. And I have yet to meet someone who has picked up the book and not learned something from it, mm. whether it was something big or something small. And uh, we've got you to thank for, for that. Oh, thanks, Mike. I'm, I'm glad that it worked out that way. And I'd love to say that I planned it all, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Probably 90% luck and 10% sweat. So, Hey, either way, it's, it's still a success. Yeah. It was ready at the right time that it needed to be released to the world, and that's a good way to think about it. Well, Mike, in all of our talking tonight, we never quite figured out a way to end this. <laughs> <laughs> and knowing you and I, we could probably keep going for another hour, you know, just talking about uh, different things and, and different stuff like that. So just in, in, in parting words, is there anything you'd like to say about this book and about this process that, that hasn't been said yet? Mm, I just would say thank you to everyone who's purchased the book for those of you who have gifted the book, uh, thank you for making it possible. I really, I can't say enough 
to thank you for making it possible. I mean, you guys are really the ones that drove this engine. You know, we can, like I said, you can make a great book, and if no one buys it, it's still still not going to go anywhere. So a big part of this was, you know, us preparing it, but a big part of it, a even bigger part was people picking it up and then applying it, right? If if people read it and it wasn't applicable and it didn't work for them, it's it also wouldn't have gone very far. So obviously there's something probably beyond what I realize that needed to be said to the world. And I thank you for, you know, making that happen and being part of it. And then I hopefully that's been a value to you and that my, my initial pain <laughs> in doing notes um, is definitely expanded and paid off in many dividends as I sit back and look backwards to where it all began. So I hope that, that, um, that it's done the same for you. And that feeling that I had like, wow, if, if this is helping me, it's got to help others that you're one of those people. So thank you for all that you've done to make it make this a reality for me. Well, I think, Mike, on behalf of all of the listeners and everyone who's ever heard the word sketchnoting, we thank you for what you've done. Well, thanks. And I guess uh, like, uh, like every other episode, uh, with that, we'll call it a wrap. And until the next episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast, we'll talk to you soon. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Rohde Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code RODI40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show. 